Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're at information session. I believe this is number 10. And um, my colleagues, Sam and Marco and the team, they're actually at a, um, the reason they're not on a call with me is because they're at a Harry Styles concert <laughs> here, in Los, here in California. And uh, I'm jealous. I wish I could go. If, if you haven't listened to his newest music, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so it's just me today with our special guest, uh, Avi Barzaev. And Sam and I met Avi when we were in Lisbon, Portugal about a week ago at the, at the AWE, the AWE uh, Summit for Europe, which is a virtual reality, mixed reality summit. And um, I actually heard Avi on a panel and I was pretty impressed with what he was sharing. And I thought it'd be great for him to share some of that with the community for the Metaverse for SDGs Global Prize in VR competition. Um, so uh, a little update on, uh, on the competition before we jump into this. Um, we're seeing a lot of great activity. I was actually out in Geneva at the, at the United Nations ITU offices about a week and a half ago. And I had a great planning session with the team of the United Nations ITU agency. And we were discussing the summit we want to have next year. Uh, ideally, the summit would be would be after June, so after way after the competition ended, but it'd be a summit in person, either in New York City or Geneva. And we would have it uh, probably a multi-day summit with many people being in person. Primarily, the goal would be to fundraise so we can bring all the winners there in person and give them their cash awards uh, while also having the community come together to talk about how the metaverse is being used for the sustainable development goals. Okay, with that said, um, Avi, I, I know that a little bit of introduction in terms of way of background. Um, you've been at this for uh, over 30 years. I think it's really interesting to talk to people that have been really in the virtual reality space for the last several decades because I know there's a really interesting story. Uh, it's been kind of a slow burn getting to where we are today uh, on the hardware and software side. Um, your background you've shared with me uh, dated back to um, some of the work that HoloLens did with Microsoft, that Microsoft did with the HoloLens hardware, um, and also uh, some of the work that I guess you ran a startup that did some of the basis for what eventually became Google Earth. And um, I think you even shared on stage that you can't talk about it, but you've even had some interactions with the Apple uh, headset that's coming out in terms of the hardware that we should expect to see from Apple. So it, bottom line is you're a knowledgeable person in the space. I think you also got a good pulse of where the industry is going because sometimes the past predicts the future. So you're seeing this evolve and you could potentially share some insights on what the job market's gonna look like and any advice you have to folks that are listening to this information session on where they might wanna focus themselves. So thanks for joining Avi, I appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, just to start, to be, to be really um, as opaque as possible about Apple, I can neither confirm nor deny uh, anything about Apple, uh, basically anything that any rumors or anything like that. So uh, folks can, Infer whatever they want, uh, but I'm but I can't say anything. So okay. um, I won't put you on the spot and ask any questions. Yeah. Although you told me before the call starts that the device comes out in two weeks, right? I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, you know, I did, but uh, yes, taking this out. I'm just I'm just getting you in trouble now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I can hear that the, the helicopter's coming already. Uh, the uh, yeah, and, and as far as the uh, Google Earth goes, I was a co-founder of the company. Uh, John Hankey, actually, who is the head of Niantic, was the CEO. Uh, and has gone on to do, you know, even even bigger things since since the little company Keyhole built those first versions of 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 before it was called Google Earth, but it was a lot of fun. And actually, that that was a big part of whatever we want to call the metaverse. That this idea of making a copy of the world that we can navigate is also pretty important. So I learned a lot about mapping um, yeah. and and data at that time too. But yeah, so I've, I've done a little bit of everything. The Hololens was first time I really got into hardware and tried to spec out what the future of AR glasses would be. It was originally going to be an entertainment device inside the Xbox division, and that didn't quite work out. And it went through a bunch of iterations and then finally showed up as more of an industrial uh, headset because that's where the, the, the money was. 
Um, and, you know, there's lots of news coming out now about, you know, whether it has a future at Microsoft or not, or whether Microsoft's just going to be a software company. Um, but it's all, it's all really interesting. And, and I've had a passion for trying to push things ahead as quickly as I can to try to sell, uh, you know, for my little part is if I could convince the big companies to spend more money uh, at the right time to push the tech along, then that's good for everybody. Um, although clearly we've seen examples of maybe, maybe you don't want to push it too fast or too hard and, and, and set expectations in an unrealistic way, because then you, you can also set things back um, by, make, by over-promising, uh, which I think we're seeing a little bit now with, uh, with meta people are reacting to a little bit of over-promising and under-delivering um, as far as their, their hype goes. Uh, but, but it's all real enough and it will be real in the future. It's just a question of time. It's a question of how long is it gonna take to get this right? And most importantly, getting the use cases right, because nothing ever succeeds just by building it. Nobody, it, what technology ever, you know, won out by just building a piece of hardware and everybody else figured out what it was good for. You have to have some idea about what it's good for and, and, and actually meet real human needs or else people don't want it, people don't need it. Um, and so the real challenge inside all these big companies was figuring that out ahead of time and, and then convincing people. And I had a lot of fun with that, having really great teams of prototypers to work with. We called it experience prototyping. And the idea was build the future now, build it as, as quickly and as cheaply as we can in a prototype form, and then show everybody what works and show everybody what doesn't work. And then we learned a lot about it. We learned, we learned stuff that probably won't be real for five years or 10 years, but we were able to try it and learn and inform the plans based on that. Um, and it, it gave us a good roadmap to the future. So I like to, I like to think, think of myself as kind of living five years ahead of wherever the market is right now, at least five years ahead. And, and doesn't mean I'm right, but at least I have some idea as to where things are going. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, from, from an outsider view looking in, cause I haven't, I've not been in the industry that long. It was, you know, I've been paying attention to it for, yeah. for, a, dec for a decade, but I He's haven't. This cat, the cat is joining us by the way. You got guests. Um, <laughs> Or that, or unless that's a digital cat, and that's a real thing. Okay. No, this is this is a real one. He's okay. yeah, very fluffy. Real is always at the end of the day. Real is always better. Yeah. <laughs> um, Look how good AR has gotten that it can actually you know pretend to be petting a cat. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, you know, from an outsider perspective looking in, for me, the big inflection point where I even started to put time and effort and energy into this space was when the Oculus Quest. Two came out, not even the Oculus Quest. It was the Oculus Quest Two, because we finally had, you know, for one, a price point that made sense, and two, an experience that I feel like some of the issues with the previous versions in terms of field of view or making you a little bit nauseated seemed to be alleviated. And then that also, I think the software side saw that there was finally a hardware device out there that would get consumer appeal. So you saw a lot of innovation happen on the software side. So the chicken and the egg e problem. Kind of started to rectify itself. What, what is what is your take on that inflection point? And do you think do you think in the next five years there'll be something else that will be somewhat of a game changer in terms of an inflection point that makes us this even more accelerated in terms of where it could go? Yeah, I think I think there's bigger inflection points to happen, and and that one is you know I'm I'm glad to hear that you were able to use the newer device without nauseation, but I'm not. And I've been in this a long time and I still get nauseated even by the high-end headsets. I can buy a thousand dollar headset and it's still not quite on the level of quality where I won't get nauseated in VR after like an hour or so. Um, and that that means I'm, I'm one of the best critics of the, of the tech, of the ergonomics of the tech. Um, it turns out it affects more women than men also. And, and um, one of the issues with these headsets, especially when you go for the low end, if you're trying to price it at 200, 299 or 399, um, it's making it much more accessible in a sense, right? Price-wise, it's much more accessible. Of course, that money, that money is, is coming from advertising, right? That money is coming from uh, um, ad budgets. And, and it's just probably worth pointing out that that you know we're all paying for that like like all the products that we buy the, all the consumer products that we buy are marked up 15 to 30 percent to pay for the the advertising budgets which then feed the ad tech companies which can then lower their prices so it's not free we're we're paying for it we just you know we should be conscious of that but the accessibility question is an important one so while i'm glad it was really useful for you there's still a lot of people out there who 
either because of the size of their of their bodies or smaller bodies, smaller interpupillary distance, right? The distance between their eyes might be small enough that these headsets don't fit them and aren't comfortable, uh, including kids. Um, but there's also people who have uh, hair that isn't the same as what the designers of the devices have. They, they might have larger uh, amounts of hair or hair that they don't wanna mess up with straps and things like that. And other accessibility issues as well, and besides the nauseation. And so these devices are still limited in accessibility for a lot of users. And I think that's that's an issue for like, you know, businesses, I advise them all the time. Like if you're gonna try to force your, 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 your employees to use this, you better be sure that you're not violating the Americans with Disability Act with, with some people who can't use these devices or it becomes uncomfortable for them because, you know, that's a that's a potential lawsuit right there if, if you're forcing people to use these and they can't. So it's good to have fallbacks to to tablets and phones and other devices that that make you know the experiences accessible even if you can't yet wear the headset. But in the future the headsets will get better. They will improve. Um, eventually we'll get to the place where everybody can use these. And and um, in general the AR headsets are better for a lot of these things than the VR headsets, especially the open ones that that seeing the real world and seeing most of the real world all the time is much more settling than being in a virtual world. So for someone who's sensitive like me, uh, having a pair of you know, transparent AR glasses is generally gonna be a much better experience uh, just, just because of the, the, the amount of the world that comes through. Unless I'm getting nauseated by the real world all the time, that, then, then you're not adding that much to make me, to make me uh, not feel well. But in a full VR world, especially if you're trying to do things like virtually move through the world without teleporting, but actually move your location, then it can be very triggering in that sense. Yeah. Well, I think um, that's I think that's the reason why I, I'm not convinced it's so much that the quality of the headset is an issue that gives people nauseate gets them nauseated. When people ask me, "Am I going to get nauseated?" I think the reality is if you put on a headset and you take a simulation that you're moving, but your feet aren't actually moving. Or you're doing things that in the real wood world would get you nauseated, like you're jumping like a virtual roller coaster, yeah, you know, or the roller coaster. I mean, of course, of course, you're going to feel nauseated. I don't. It seems to me that before I felt like I got nauseated because the latency when I turned my head would not track with the movement of my head. You know, there'd yeah. be latency, and that would That's... be an odd feeling to experience, and it would make you nauseated. Now I feel like if I do things that don't get me nauseated in the real world. Yeah. They're not going to get me nausinated in virtual reality. Um, no, that's it's you have you. I'm, I'm guessing you have a little bit higher threshold. So, so the new devices are good for you, but there's still going to be also, plenty of people. You also said it after an hour, you start to feel sick. I don't think I've ever been in VR for more than an hour at a time. <laughs> well, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, look, the, you know, it, it's a little bit of a digression, but if you're interested, you can you can certainly edit this part out if you want. But but the reason that people get nauseated is the same reason that people get get sick if they drink too much, and that is our bodies have no defense against poisoning. The only, the only way that we know that we've been poisoned is when our vision gets blurry or the latency gets you know, sort of soggy or what we feel doesn't match what we see, which all happen in VR in various ways. Sometimes even when you're not moving, sometimes just standing there, like you said, the latency, but it could also be the resolution or the optics um, could also affect us. Um, so all those things tell our body that we've been poisoned. And so the body's natural response is get rid of the poison. Uh, and there's one thing that we can't, still can't quite solve, which is that inner ear sense of motion that when we're moving, you know, or when we're tilted in some way, or there's an acceleration of any sort, um, we can't create that, that, that sensation of it. So it's still best in VR to just not not move you artificially, let you walk, let you actually, there's yeah. a thing called redirected walking. If you have a large enough space, it works. You could be walking in a circle, but you perceive yourself as walking in a straight line. And so basically you're just limited to wherever you wanna walk in the virtual world. You can have an infinite space, which, which finally was, answers the question yeah. of the holodeck. How, how can anybody in a holodeck uh, in fictionally walk forever, but not hit the walls, right? It's because they make you walk in a circle. That's I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was, I thought the criteria was a radius of nine feet, uh, basically um, three meters, roughly three meters. And with a three meter space, you can trick someone to think that they're walking infinitely in a straight line, but reality and virtual reality, you're really directing them in a circle, which is makes yeah. it 
Yeah, yeah the, the, the cognitive cues, it's a whole other topic, but we can trick people into doing that. You just need that space to be totally clear, right? You can't have a coffee table, you can't have other furniture in that, in that volume or else you're going to eventually hit it. Uh, although there's some redirected walking that could actually get you to walk around obstacles without you know, noticing it, but that, that's harder. That's harder. Yeah. It, it, also, the, um, what I noticed was because not everyone wants to put on a headset, but because enough software got out there and headsets did get out there, especially during COVID, I noticed that the experience on the desktop which wasn't very good on these platforms, but in the headset, it was much better. You could have all the functionality in the headset. You saw over the course of like a year, the demand drive more functionality on the desktop version of the software as well. So now yeah. on your computer desktop, you can do things in a virtual reality platform. Now, obviously you're not fully immersed. So you lose some of that sensation of being 360. However, the experience on the desktop is actually highly productive. There's a lot of functionality. You, you have access to all the functionality. You can manipulate things. My mm -hmm. team starts to use the desktop to build environments and doesn't even use the headset anymore. It's a completely different way of building, right? Because when the headset, yeah. you're, you're using your virtual hands to create things and it's more intuitive versus on a desktop, you've got to use some keystrokes and so forth to, to manipulate things. But that's yeah. it's nice to see that too. Yeah, look, that's, that helps for the accessibility question. The desktop certainly easier and more accessible. Um, and for all these virtual worlds, the first question is, what do you do? What's your reason for being in the world? And for you, maybe it's building spaces or sharing those spaces. Uh, ultimately, the reason we want to wear the headsets or any kind of glasses, hopefully, hopefully they shrink down from headsets to something small. The ultimate reason we want to wear those things is, is for what we call co-presence, right? Is to feel like you're in a space with other people and to have that feel as natural, ultimately, as face-to-face. -face. And, and it requires really good spatial audio. It, it does ultimately require eye tracking and face tracking or some way of capturing us so that we're portrayed accurately to everybody else in the space so that they get the right emotions from us, the subconscious. You know, there's all this psychological transference and counter-transference that happens between people that makes us feel comfortable with each other and at ease. And that has to happen in a virtual world as well. And, and to date, we're still not there. The, the devices aren't quite good enough. The representations aren't good enough. It doesn't require photorealism, but it requires emotional realism. It requires being true to our let personalities. Me, let, me ask you, let me ask you this. Yeah. On that same note, because I think you're right. I think the holy grail, or at least a big inflection point, and this is Zuckerberg even talks about this, is when you really do feel like you are co-present with someone, right? And right now, I mean, your experience right now is you're looking at an avatar. The avatar on some of these platforms will take a photo of you and then some AI in the cloud will convert that photo into your avatar. And it does a pretty decent job of at least making a, what looks like a photo of you on top of an avatar. But I think, can you take us through that? I mean, so step one, the spatial audio is real important to making you feel you're there with someone. What do you think? I mean, obviously the front facing cameras that you now see on the Oculus Pro that just came out, the front facing cameras, I think there's six or seven front facing cameras that, you know, you heard Zuckerberg on Joe Rogan's podcast recently talking about that. And Joe Rogan, who's a pretty, you know, he's not going to do Zuckerberg any favors. He usually plays it pretty straight. He, he said it was like incredible because like anything, his facial expressions he gave whether you raised an eyebrow or wrinkled his forehead and a lot of nonverbal cues. And most of our communication is humans to each other is through nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that with the current versions of the headsets. Do you think the front facing cameras is a big step? And what else do you think is required to make that happen? Um, yeah, the, the, the internal cameras that are looking at your, at, your, at your own face, I think are important. Although you could say, look, if, if what we really had at the end of the day was a really nice pair of AR glasses that look like this, then you wouldn't need all those cameras either because you can see, you can see my eyes right now. You can see my face in a video form. So an external camera could capture us just fine if the headset was this light and this small. But because the headset's so big and bulky, we've got to add those cameras inside of it because they otherwise can't see our face, right? Um, the, the, the test of whether it's working well is not can it recreate normal human emotions, but is it making the right emotions? And so, you know, this it has to pass the, um, you know, what you might call the mother test or the spouse test. You want to get people who know each other really well, 
in the same space together. And you know it's working if they can sense each other correctly. But if somebody you know turns and says, "Are you okay? You seem kind of off today," or uh, you know, "Are you on drugs?" or you know, "Are you sick?" or anything like, if they get the wrong cues, then something's wrong with the model of how we're capturing and portraying these things. And that can happen. That's that's kind of the worst case is that you're you're sitting there trying to do a job interview of the future. A, you're a little bit limited by being a cartoon character in the first place because the photorealism is hard to do right now. And, but if it gives the wrong emotion at the wrong time, then the, like you said, those subconscious cues can undermine you instead of helping you. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The other is, can people cheat? Can, can a salesperson add a little bit of extra AI that makes them seem better than they are in real life. And so even though maybe they'd be not trustworthy in real life, they can, they can put the trustworthy filter on, then all of a sudden the software pretends that they are making the, you know, the appropriate amount of, of, of eye contact and facial gestures in order to actually win your trust. If we knew exactly how to do that, you could see people using that for good or for bad. Um, we have to grapple with all these issues still. What does it mean to own your own presentation, but but do so in a positive way. So people people can be themselves and not be subject to other people deciding who they are, but also be on their honest self and and uh, and not trick other people uh, in any yeah. way. Well, the, the also the, um, you know, going back to what you're saying about the photorealism of the avatar, I, I did see what played out with these platforms, you know, because we were using quite a diff few different platforms and we kind of saw all of them pivoting on their strategy as they saw where the market was moving. And you saw some platforms um, like Spatial, for example, they had a very realistic, photorealistic avatar at one point. The yeah. problem was it was so photorealistic, it consumed so much processing power of the device <clears throat> that you could only have 15 of those photorealistic avatars in a room before the thing would start to crash. Right. Because they were so high resolution and so realistic of the face. And now, if you look at their product, they've got a decent, a decent avatar, but they've totally, it, it appears to me at least, that they've totally sacrificed the quality of the photorealism, the avatar, in order to have more people in the, in the space. That's why, you see, that's why you see certain platforms like Horizons, which has hundreds or thousands of avatars running around, but they look like complete cartoons because they can't, the photorealism is actually a memory hog. It's using too much process, it's using too much memory on the hardware devices, which I assume within a few years, you know, if you look at Moore's law, that will be a thing of the past too. You know, eventually we'll get if, super high processing power. If if the reason they're do if, if the reason that they're scaling down the avatar is, is processing power, then they're probably making the mistake. Because if you look at the at the science of vision, um, we only see a narrow slice of the world in high resolution. Everything else in the periphery is actually very low resolution. And so if you have eye tracking. You, yeah. could, you could actually make, make it so that the only, the only avatar that you're looking at right now, because you can only basically look at one person at a time, right? Yeah. If I'm looking at you, you're high resolution and then everybody else is low. Yeah. And then if I look at someone else then you become low. So that's a solvable problem. And, that, and that's where you, the industry has gone too. Yeah, that's totally, you nailed that. I mean, that, that's what they've started to do now. They've started to yeah. make it. You talk to an engineer who's dealing with the hardware, they had this problem. And then I think it was, I actually think it was a call we had with Spatial or Engage or one of the one of the teams, or the engineering team. And they explained to us, yeah, that what they're going to do is especially with especially with eye tracking, so cameras that look at you. So this would be the Oculus Quest Pro. Mm -hmm. The camera will see that you're looking at directly ahead or off to the right or off to the left. And it will give you higher resolution just where you look and everything else will be de degraded resolution in order to save memory. And so that, yeah, I guess that's that's where the industry is headed, right? In terms of trying to yeah. deal with that, yeah. Yeah, so that, that should help, but there's still the issue of if you make an avatar too photorealistic, but do it incorrectly, you can do more harm than good. You only want to add additional channels of information, additional streams like eyes or mouth movements or hands or fingers. You only want to add it when it is additive, not subtractive. And if, if if I was sitting here and my hands were doing something random, then you would think that either it was broken or I had a condition, right? It would pre, it would be portraying the wrong information to represent me in, in this current thing. So you, you want to make sure it's always correct. And that's, that is one of the reasons to dial it down besides just performance. It's just to make sure that we don't 
we don't lie about things. That's the best reason for not putting legs in right now. Is if you don't have good leg data, you don't want to fake it. You don't want to just put, you know, Kermit the Frog legs on people that just move on their own just so that the feet are planted. Um, because it's weird when you look down at yourself and your virtual legs are not doing what re your real legs are doing. That's weird. But it's also weird for other people when it conveys the wrong information about yourself. You might look sad or excited uh, when you're not. And, and, and that's, that's more harm than good. So we'll get there. Eventually, legs will be possible. It's difficult because, uh, you know, not, again, this is an accessibility issue is you can imagine the cameras on the headset that are looking down at your own body. It turns out machine learning is very robust for seeing your legs at a really weird angle. They can figure out what your legs are doing, but they've got to be able to see them. And if you have a body type that doesn't see your own feet and your legs from the head position, which is true for, for a number of people in the world that you know, it could be pregnancy, it could be, it could be size of their body, they may not see their own feet. And, and so these devices aren't gonna work well for them because the camera is gonna have a very limited view. And other, for other people, it will work better. That unfortunately is one of those accessibility issues, again, that's gonna cause this to work for some people and not others. What, what, is the, what are the things that you look forward to coming to market in the next five years with your experience on the hardware side or even the software side that that we don't that maybe you know that isn't common knowledge yet in terms of that will be inflection points or really improve the experience um you know again without this is not you know hinting at any particular company but one of the reasons when i worked on echo frames at amazon one of the reasons that we went that way is that we wanted to start with glasses that were normal looking, that it's something that people would choose to wear, but then add a little bit of technology into them. Not a lot, not, there's no display in Echo Frames, there's just audio, but you wanna be careful. Everything you add has a price. Every piece of technology you add has a cost. Cameras, especially when you start adding cameras, there's a social cost as we saw with Google Glass, um, there can be a big blowback. And so you wanna be careful about adding things. And so I think, my guess is there's going to be more and more products on the market that use all the same tech that we could imagine ultimately living in the perfect high-end pair of AR glasses that do everything, but, but dial it back. Dial it back to just what do we need today. Not, not, don't try to do everything all at once, but focus on real-world needs. And you have, you, know, you have a company like Humane that hasn't quite said what they're doing, but what it looks like from everything we've heard is they may not have even something you wear on your face. It might be it might be something you put on your clothing right down around here. And, it, and it, it's there to, to help you, to assist you with some AI in terms of your daily life. That's all the same tech. They won't call it AR. They'll just call it AI. But it's, it's again, it's, it's using computers to try to help us improve our lives. And that's the goal of AR as well. It's just that AR tends to be a lot more visual in terms of its injection into the world and how it helps us. But you could do the same things with audio only audio only AR can be incredibly powerful if the AI is both working for your benefit, not for advertising, but also has good context. It understands the world so that it can actually give you contextually relevant hints about things you can do. Uh, those, those are all things that um, could make your lives better and things people might choose to buy as opposed to this sort of field the dreams approach of build it and then hope somebody figures out what the hell it's good for. Mm -hmm. What about on the um, what about your experience on the software side in terms of the in terms of the platforms? Well, so now we get into this whole discussion of what is the metaverse and and how is that going to affect our lives? And it's a, it's a huge can of worms. But let's just say that I have high hopes that within the next five years we will create some amount of interoperable standards, just like we did for the web, right? That will allow. 3D spaces to be able to share content in some ways, at, at the very least share experiences. So I should be able to go into Fortnite and then create a doorway to Roblox or wherever else I wanna go. I'm picking two examples from today, but five years will be new examples. Mm -hmm. um, and be able to travel between all these places. If you think about the way the web was built, the web wasn't built by, except for maybe GeoCities, if you remember that, the web wasn't built by building a map and then everybody populates the map. It was built by everybody puts up a website and then creates links between their site and, and other sites. And that forms a network, a graph of all these interconnected places. And then the web is the sum of all those things. And the simplest way to think of the metaverse, ignoring all the web three stuff for, for now, 
is it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be a bunch of disconnected spaces like Roblox and Fortnite that learn that find reasons for interconnecting themselves. And then maybe five years from now, or maybe 10 years from now, if it, if it takes longer, the standards will exist so that those things build a, a, a metaverse out of all those pieces that the, the just like the, the web is the sum of those places. The, the metaverse is the sum of those places, not any one of them. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm well, hopeful. That's, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the ITU agency of the United Nations, which is the group that we're working with on this competition and for the summit next year, that is the role of that agency within the UN ecosystem. Right. You know, their, their role is interoperability, standards. That's what they've been focused on for the last 30, 40 years, you know, working on trying to make sure the internet had interoperability. No matter what hardware device you use to get on the internet, you could get on and have the similar experience. You didn't have to retrofit, as well as any software that you built your website on. Once it was on the internet, it all worked together. So their yeah. their mission is to figure out the interoperability standards and infrastructure to build out what's called the metaverse. By, by the way, that's why they're interested in doing this work with Exponential Destiny when, when we approached them about focusing on, I mean, our interest was using it as a great education platform to bring awareness, education, empathy around the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've talked to them about, including the, sec the new secretary general, Ms. Dor uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin, who was just elected the secretary general of the ITU. I just met with her a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. She'll be, she's the elect, so she'll start in January. Um, you know, one of the things we discussed is that when we have the summit and we have the 17 finalists from this community of ours that create these imaginary worlds or stories to bring to life their specific sustainable development goal, what will be apparent to everyone is the value, like, wow, these are amazing. You know, we basically crowdsourced some amazing imaginations that came up with really unique ways to teach people about something really important. These goals of the UN, zero poverty, no hunger, life below water, quality education. I mean, these are important topics. Um, that will be the positive thing we'll see from this experiment or this competition we're running. The, the issue will be that probably out of the 17 finalists, you know, five of them will be on engaged platforms. Three of them will be on Spatial's platform. Four of them will be on Horizon's platform. Some of them will be used, the teams will have used Oculus Quest 2. Some they would have used a Hewlett Packard device. And the reality is, this is a great 17, you know, this is a great metaverse of, of these experiences, but you can't get from one to the other yeah. without some major overhaul. And that's yeah. going to be the whole purpose of why we're doing it is to show like it has huge potential, but we're still a long way away from having an interconnected, you know, next generation of the web that's immersive and experiential. Yeah, I totally agree. And I guess this, this may be a good place to also talk about um, the XR Guild and how, how we hope to help all this because we, we're not a standards body. We're not trying to solve the interoperability ourselves, but we created an organization um, and, and, you know, this is along similar lines to what you're saying. We, we have taken the learnings from the last 30 years and the mistakes that we've made. That 30 years that I've spent in this field, not only did I build things, but I made a lot of mistakes and, and saw a lot of other people make mistakes as well, including some of the mistakes, mistakes are too much openness. It sounds like an oxymoron. How can you have too much openness? But it turns out the openness of the protocols of the web allowed for us to be spied upon, allowed for companies to build up profiles about us, allowed for things like web bugs that could track us. And we permitted this because we didn't know better, but now we know better. And as we design what the metaverse will be, we would better learn all those lessons and apply them and make sure this next generation is better. I like to joke, but we shouldn't make the same mistakes. We should always make new ones, bigger and better mistakes, right? The same mistakes are boring. We should, we should have solved those. So what we're trying to do is to create a level of education for professionals in the field, which includes young people coming up and wanting to be in the field. But we want people to come in and learn about the ethical principles that, that we've discovered over this time. It's been a journey for me from the beginning to now to learn these things. And hopefully, for other people, it won't take them 30 years. They can learn it much faster because we'll be sharing it. And, and the goal is that as we build this future, we can demonstrate the better ways to build things and not make those same mistakes. So, so that has to inform these open standards and those protocols as well, because some of the companies who are the most biggest proponent of openness, as they say, 
also want access. They want openness in order to get at the information they need to continue their business model. And the companies that they say are closed are actually trying to protect us, even though they may be very parochial and proprietary. They have a sense of, no, we act, our customers want some level of protection. They want do not track. They, they don't want to be exploited. We're going to have to wrestle with this. And so some of the um, some of the things that I, I can imagine teams working on to try to demonstrate aren't just the positive uses, but also how to mitigate the risks. How do we allow people to express their identity in a way that's safe for other people and non-exploitive and also not abusive? Those are interesting questions. How, like solving identity is really a really hard problem. Um, solving for privacy and safety is a really hard problem. And how are we going to how are we going to do all that uh, so that we we help everybody in a very you know equitable way. That's that's a huge challenge, and I would encourage teams to be thinking about that as well as the use cases. The positive use cases are super important to solve as well. Also, there's you know I, I try to speak about this a lot because I think it's a responsible thing to do. Is there's a lot of isolationism and even addiction, even to the extent where I think your brain will react to highly realistic, immersive environments um, the same way that you look for escapism, that people look for escapism in alcohol or drugs, right? Because they're going to have a, the, the effect on your brain is going to almost be similar um, to that. You saw this study by MIT. MIT uh, came out with a recent article. I thought it was, I thought they actually tested this at MIT or maybe the article was just out of MIT Sloan. But this was just two months ago. It was a virtual reality experienced brain. So someone who experienced virtual reality went through an experience that the MRI could not distinguish their brain from a brain that was uh, on magic mushrooms, wow. and, you know, an LC, uh, LSD. Yeah. You know, that's just probably the start of this, you know, and yeah. so... Yeah. Well, for some for some people, that's the reason to do it. That that's what they watch. They they are looking for that escape from reality. And um, you know, the, there may be some some benefits to being able to step outside our normal lives briefly. But I think the problem is if we do it too much and we detach from reality, then that's also not healthy. Uh, but some people have reported, you know, consciousness level awakenings from from yeah. some alternate therapies. And I think I have it personally, but I, I find it interesting to think that there are ways to unlock new parts of ourselves. But I think there's a large number of people, maybe not large is not the right word, but there's a substantial at least number of people who see VR especially as a way to escape from reality because maybe their reality is not what they want it to be. And, it, and it's easier in some sense to have worlds which have less rules they have less constraints, um, and and for some of these people, it's a, it's it's an escape from the physicality of their of their bodies, and, and they want to be inhabit other bodies that are different. And I think it's a, it's it's some it can be a healthy thing to explore, but if we're too detached from reality, we got to remember like we still need to eat, we still need to breathe, right? We we can't we're not getting rid of those things by going into VR. We're just forgetting about them for a while. Yeah. And we don't want to become so dependent on this that we that we lose touch with reality. Yeah, I think that's got to be the biggest debate of the next, you know, five, six, seven years, because I think you will start to see the photorealism of the experience will become so accurate and the resolution will become so accurate that, I mean, I already can tell now when I put on a, you know, one of the latest headsets, you can already tell like, oh my gosh, if this gets 10% better, this is going to feel pretty darn real. And so you have to assume that in the next five years, it'll do more than 10%. It will probably do 10x better, right? That's the exponential pace at sure. which this technology is progressing. So what, can, what, what I think we, what you're going to find an interesting debate on is how healthy or unhealthy is this? Now, your, your instinct would be that this is very unhealthy. People are going to get addicted. They're going to go into escapism. But there's another side to that coin. There's a side of that coin that says, well, you know what? Maybe people will find new life and ambition and invigoration from having a different experience and a different body, whether it's the visual stimulation, whether it's the pe way people react to them and treat them, whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know, but it's really going to be really interesting to see what the research shows after, I mean, we're kind of all guinea pigs, aren't we? <laughs> we are, we're, 
we're experimenting on ourselves and, and you know, we're, we're brain hacking ourselves in a way by doing this. And, you know, all I can say is let's just be careful, right? There's, there is no advantage to rushing. There's nothing to be gained by trying to go faster than the tech supports, right? Um, like I said, I like to be five years ahead of the tech curve, but even then I'm pretty careful. I, I have learned early in my career, somebody put a laser on a table and say, hey, look, I can create a virtual image in your eyeball with this laser on the table. I'm like, okay, let me see that. Now I'm like, hold on, eye safety. Let's think about this because there's all sorts of repercussions that can happen um, that are in some ways permanent. Um, and you know, with, with VR, the thing we have to be the most careful about right now is not so much with an adult. Adults are gonna be able to tell if the thing is working for them or not in general. We're, we're, you know, we're mature enough to understand that this thing is being harmful for most, most cases, that we haven't un uncovered yet the equivalent of gambling or drug addiction for VR. They may, that may exist. It may, there may be a dopamine loop that we get into like that. that we haven't quite uncovered that. But what we do know is for kids, it's dangerous because if a child is, is telling their parents that there's monsters under the bed and the parents have to, as a nighttime ritual, have to make sure the room is safe, that child is not yet capable of discerning fantasy from reality. And they're too young to use most experiences in VR. We have to be really careful. And, and even though they might be able to watch a video game on a screen, that's like Call of Duty type graphics where it might be violent or you might shoot guns. The parents might decide that's okay for their kids. It's not okay in VR because our experience of VR is that these things feel real and they form memories that feel real. And so if you're traumatized or abused in VR, it feels very much like as if you were traumatized or abused in real life. And that can be debilitating for an entire lifetime ahead. You yeah. have to be super that's careful like about that. So those work with Pete. Skip Rizzo with post-traumatic stress syndrome. You yeah. know, I've had some conversations with him. He's one of the leading researchers on treating Iraqi, not Iraqi, treating veterans in general veterans, right? or veterans right. on dealing with trauma by basically having them create new memories, which is right. really interesting, isn't it? It's like he basically, the treatment is let's help, let's essentially help put you through simulations where we recreate your memories to, so that they're not so traumatic for you. Yeah. Yeah, this this happens in in a, in in, psych, in psychology without VR as well, where they're trying they're trying to move the memory from a place where it's triggering and traumatizing into a place where it's safe in within your own brain. It, it, you can move some traumatic memories so that they're not as triggering. You still remember them, but but they don't have the same effect on you as they did. And you have to be very careful not to overdo it because if you put a veteran in the middle of a simulated war you're not helping them. You're, you're probably making it worse by creating new memories that are just as bad as some of the ones that they might have. And what you want to do is be very, very sensitive. This is why it does require doctors to do this. You don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go to a startup that didn't have you know, PhDs in psychology on this subject to try to solve this. Because if you, I, I, I have a, there's a person I know who worked um, at the Holocaust Museum and initially made a recreation of the Holocaust in VR with good intentions, but found it was incredibly traumatizing to see yourself in, in, in the experience of Holocaust victims. Um, it, it can cause its own kind of trauma and, and not, it isn't educational in the way you would hope. It, it can be very you know, impressing on people of, of this kind of a trauma. And I think the same is true of companies who are trying to create diversity, equity, and inclusion apps in VR. You can overdo it and cause people to have the opposite response. If you're trying to create tolerance and understanding, you can cause people to actually feel um, angry and, and um, put off about race relations because they've been traumatized by bad experiences in VR and that can affect them in real life. So you have to be super careful about how you approach this and design it and test it really well and make sure you're not pushing snake oil on, on, on businesses or populations. It's a little bit like giving scissors to a baby in some cases. And we're probably yeah. not thinking about it. In closing, um, I know you have also, you got a good kind of lens on different parts of the industry in terms of job opportunities, in terms of where if people are interested in getting into this field. I mean, we've, we've shared with this community through one of our information sessions, we had the CEO of a company called Blendhub come on, uh, Henrik, uh, and he shared why he's hiring people with this skill set to build out VR spaces for his business. And people can watch 
on our YouTube channel. They can watch that information session because it's very interesting. It, it, it goes to what I'm seeing, which is every brand, every company and every brand and service provider or product offering is going to experiment with creating something immersive and virtual um, for, around their brand. You just saw, I just saw an article, people can look this up, Burberry, you know, the, the high-end clothing store. Yeah. They just did a partnership with, um, with one of the, I can't remember which platform it is, but they made a whole story and the chief marketing officer of Burberry talks about this big investment they made to build out the story around their brand. Everybody will do this. I mean, you have a fiduciary responsibility to be experimenting with this if you're an executive in a company at this point. It's kind of like 1992 when people are telling you there's this thing called the web and it's going to be important to your product or your company or your brand. And rather than just saying, well, I'm going to wait and see, I think everyone's learned, no, there's something here. Um, we should probably experiment. What, what, Other than being a creator around a space, either using a platform like Engage or Spatial or Unity or Unreal Engine to create those spaces. What are other fields that you think are job opportunity fields? Yeah, I, I right now the growth opportunity is in the AI side. I think that um, learning about machine learning is actually really important. And it's something I wish I had invested more in uh, because for example, I had this vision in 1992 of the holodeck of wanting to go in and just tell a computer what I wanted and it would create it for me. And for 30 years, I've had to learn all sorts of tools to do that. But how long is it going to be before those tools become somewhat obsolete? If I go and spend all my time learning Maya, high-end modeling package, and in, in two to three years, I can tell a computer what I want, that that it's investment right, that right, I made. Yeah, I think this is interesting. I don't think much of our audience is going to track much on what we mean by this. Like to so describe how, because yeah. I've heard this discussion too, in terms of how artificial intelligence and machine learning will end up creating these spaces for us based on us just speaking what we want to see. Yeah, I think that, that you know, it's certainly not possible for Steven Spielberg to just speak the movie he wants and all of a sudden a computer could figure it out and, and it shows up. There's a lot, there's a couple of hundred people required to take Spielberg's idea and turn it into a movie, right? What we want is ultimately an AI that can let you basically talk to it about the script that you want to talk, the story you want to tell, and out comes a movie. Or better yet, an interactive drama that's the future of storytelling that isn't a traditional movie. Uh, mm -hmm. That was always my dream, was to be able to be a movie maker and do that. And, and, and I've wanted the tools for years, and the closest we've gotten as of now are things like Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, Dolly, um, which let us type in a text prompt and let the computer interpret that and give us an image. It still requires a lot of iteration and a lot of work to get the computer to understand what we had in mind. It's non-trivial. The computer can't just guess the right thing immediately. But the fact that it can make pictures at all is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's only going to get better. So there's a ton of investment going into this space right now. And within a year or two, we're going to see 3D examples of that. So you're going to be able to describe a scene saying, you know, make a spaceship uh, and, and, and put in a, a command deck and put in 30 virtual people. And, and the system will be able to generate that and populate it with at least dumb AIs that can pretend to be doing something. Again, it's not going to be the next Spielberg level movie, but that's where everybody's individual skill as a storyteller, a director, creator can come in and enhance it, where you get in and go in and tweak it and make it better than what the computer did. That's the collaboration between people and machines that I think is going to be a big, big deal over the next 10 years. And the goal is that everybody can create. Everybody can have ideas in their head. And, and sometimes we're only going to use these tools just to express ourselves. So that if I'm trying to explain to you a place that I visited that I don't have pictures of, I could describe it. And you can now see it realized in a way that you'll understand what I mean better than the words. Better, the words are fuzzy. And, and, and so the, the visualization is better. Yeah, I mean, think about, you know, we, at Exponential Destiny, we work with a lot of schools and, and under-resourced communities trying to give them new capabilities. So imagine a teacher, I mean, we're saying to teachers today, teacher, get in this environment and you can bring to life a subject to teach a student it in a way that will imprint it in their memory much better than if you just passively talk about it or present it in PowerPoint in front of the class. Mm -hmm. Bring them into these environments or have the students create their environments. What you're getting at is, you know, five to 10 years from now, the ability for the teacher and students all to be in virtuality headsets, but 
the teacher on the fly can say, okay, students, I'm going to tell you about the history of dinosaurs. And for this, here's a dinosaur. And the artificial intelligence that's listening to her will create any object and 3D object and bring it in and animate it in a way that lets her, him or her really create a story in real time yeah. through this creative art form and this medium of virtual reality. Exactly. And, and not just for history or natural, you know, uh, you know, evolution, biology, but for math as well, right? The, yeah. the best understanding of math is when you can see the equations and play with them and understand them by taking them apart and seeing what changes happen. How does, how does playing with this one variable affect the shape of this curve that I'm looking at? Mm -hmm. um, and physics and chemistry, you get down in the molecules and start playing with things. And so we could put two molecules together and see what happens. What happens when I, when I add an acid and a base and I can visualize it, right? All these things are, really, are super powerful, I think. And yeah, we wanna to get to the point where students can, can explore on their own and teachers can be the great storytellers that they already are, but they have better tools to do that. So they're not relying on books that were written by someone else, uh, but they're much more interactive spaces. That's, that's all open and people today can get good at that, uh, can, can work on that. I think the, the, the biggest need right now and the biggest demand, if someone is just graduating and what, or is just going to college and wants to know what to study, the AI side is, is gonna be the biggest demand in the short term. It has been traditionally content creation. Content creation has been the bottleneck because it's very expensive. But the goal is to get content creation to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so that means fewer people will be needed in the future. Uh, yeah. Although we could do it for fun. We just won't, not all of us will be doing it. For uh, our, I guess for job security, jobs. if for job security, the long-term job security, it's interesting because artificial intelligence and conversations around any topic relative to relevant, you know, if you talk robotics, if you talk to people in robotics, I was just with Dean Kamen, who's one of the best robotics people in the world at his first robotics competition in Geneva a few weeks ago. And, you know, you see all these teams competing around the world with robotics. The ones that are going to win are the ones that are using the most AI. I mean, AI yeah. is basically a good fallback for almost about any profession right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And as so long as we understand the because, ethics of it. Yeah. Because they knock on wood because we might be creating our overlords that eventually take us out, but yeah. Yeah. We have to be super careful. It's one of these things where we're, and especially when it comes to the neural networks, because even the experts don't really know how they work. Like you, you may build a model and it works, but you can't necessarily understand why it's working. And so you never know what the, what the unintended consequences are going to be. And we have to be super careful and test these things really well, because there's already been a lot of problems with, with diversity issues, with, with uh, AI. Um, and and the, the truth is, the fundamental truth of all these AI is it's only as good as the data we feed it, right? Yeah. If we put crap in it, we're going to get crap out of it. And so we've got to learn how to how to really evaluate these things well and make them accountable so that when they when they are wrong, we can fix them and go back and figure out why are they wrong and and maybe even who's responsible for not taking all the steps they need to take to make them to make them responsible. yeah, there's a there's a platform out there called Tailspin, and the CEO actually lives locally here near me. and uh, um, I know him really well. He's they actually just acquired a a group out of Singularity University. Um, but but anyways, Tailspin was making uh, AI avatars, you know, where you could go yeah. do a job interview or you could go um, uh, be taught something for corporate training. And the avatar that was teaching you that could respond to questions and reactions was one part. Um, you know, flowchart based avatar. If it hears this, it's going to take you down this path. And but one part was one part using um, sentiment analysis and listening to you and being able to decipher what you're asking, natural language processing, a form of AI, and actually being able to answer questions. And I think we're on the, I mean, I think that's the next big thing that happens is you'll be, you'll be in virtual reality environments and you won't know if the the person that's teaching you, the avatar that's teaching you, if there's actually a real person behind it. And that kind of becomes an interesting thing to think about as well. I think we're gonna have to know though. I think that we're gonna need rules that that let us know if the person is a real person or not. And it, it, you know, it may be a hybrid. We may have the equivalent of old, remember old answering machines, right? And not, not everybody in the US uses uh, even voicemail anymore, but, but we used to have these answering machines and imagine there's an AI answering machine that can be a proxy for you, but, if you really want to jump into that conversation, you can assume the same body and now become a live incarnation of yourself. I think we're going to see that, but we're going to always want to be honest about whether I'm, am I talking to the real you or am I talking to your proxy or some other AI? 
well, we, we see deep fakes already giving us a hint of whether people are going to be honest all the time. Anyways, yeah. um, listen, I, we're kind of out of time. Avi, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and experience with our community. We'll get this posted on our YouTube channel and hopefully people can learn from your, your past experiences and your wisdom. So thanks for joining us. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.